You're listening to the Just Japan Podcast. Everything you want to know about Japan. Hey there, folks, and welcome to episode number 173 of the Just Japan Podcast, everything you want to know about Japan. My name's Kevin, and I'm the host of the Just Japan Podcast, a podcast that brings you each and every week a new aspect of life in Japan, stuff about travel, stuff about history, hobbies, jobs, you name it, we cover it. 172 episodes so far, and we're happy to bring you another great one. This week, it's all about travel in Japan, and if you ever come to Japan, a really wonderful option for you. Is to stay in the kind of traditional Japanese inn known as the Okan. And of course, if you're in Japan, you really need to take the time to relax, slow down, and enjoy the comforts of life. The onsen. That's right. Natural hot springs. They're throughout Japan. They're amazing. They're wonderful. I recommend them. But you know what? This week, we've got a man who knows a heck of a lot more about onsen and the Okan than I do. Uh, I'm very fortunate to have been able to sit down with Rob Goss, who is a travel writer based out of Tokyo, and he recently published a book about onsen and ryokan in Japan. So he's going to tell us all about it later on in the podcast. Now, of course, you can find the Just Japan podcast on all major podcatchers. Just do a Google search for us. And、uh, I want to thank, I want to thank、um, all you awesome people out there for listening. This month, January. Has been a fantastic month for the Just Japan podcast. Of course,、um, I was basically kind of dormant with the podcast for more than six months when I made my big move from Japan to Beijing. But now we're back each and every week, and it's amazing that so many of you have tuned back in and are enjoying the episodes and downloading them. So, to all of you listeners, thank you very much. And of course,、uh, I've been very active over on the Just Japan Stuff Facebook page. That's a Facebook page for the podcast. Loads of great content about Japan over there. So go like Just Japan Stuff on Facebook. And of course, the home of the podcast is justjapanstuff.com. Go there, check it out. That's where the show notes are each and every week, and you can find all the links to the things that I talk about in the podcast. And yeah, of course, follow me on Twitter at jlandkev. And that's it, that does it. So,、uh, folks, let's get into the nitty gritty of this week's episode, where I sit down and talk to Rob Goss, who wrote a book. Um, and he's written a lot of books about Japan, but the most recent one is about onsen and ryokan. So let's、uh, learn a little bit more about what those are. Okay, all right, folks out there in Just Japan podcast land, it is episode number 173 of the show. And this evening, we're going to be talking about onsens and ryokan in Japan. And if you don't know what those are, well, I've got the person to tell you all about it this evening. Uh, with us this evening here at the Dish Japan podcast, his first time guest, Rob Goss. Rob, thank you for joining us. Hello? Oh, we've gone dead already, haven't we? Oh, my gosh, eh? Rita. It's amazing. We have. We have... <laughs> Uh, okay, okay. I'll, I'll just kick that off again and、uh, okay. cross our fingers. Okay, folks, so it's episode number 173 of the podcast. And this evening, we're going to be talking about onsens and ryokan in Japan. And if you don't know what an onsen is or a ryokan, I've got the right person for you this evening.、Uh, it's first time guest, Rob Goss. Rob, thank you for joining us on the podcast. No, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me on, Kevin. That's great.、Um, now, actually, Rob, I, we, we tried this interview a few months ago, but we had some connectivity problems. One of the issues you have when you live behind the Great Firewall of China.、Um, but、uh, Rob was kind enough to join us again, and、uh, we're going to give it another whirl.、Um, so, Rob, can you tell、uh, the Just Japan podcast listeners a little bit about yourself,、uh, where you're from, and what you do here in Japan? Okay.、Um... I'm trying not to repeat what I said last time. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter because、uh, uh, no one ever heard that interview. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's very true, isn't it? But,、yeah. um, well, I'm a writer and I'm based in Tokyo. But originally, I'm from Dartmoor National Park in the southwest of England. Okay. And I came over here in 1999 as、wow. a novice, which I'm sure lots of people listening to this, if they're based in Japan, would have come over. 
perhaps it's Nova or ECC or one of mm. those kind of companies. So I, I think I've, I've come over in the same way that many, many other people have come to Japan and then you just find your own way, you know. You kind of transition out of that. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's amazing. I've got, I've got a dog <laughs> next to me trying to get out of the room I'm in. So can I just... Yeah, yeah, no problem, no problem. Throw the dog out. <laughs> okay, done. Nice. Um, you know, it's it's, okay. very, it's very interesting because, you know... Okay, uh, what I was just going to say is that with regards to, uh, you know, you said that you came over in 1999 with Nova. Um, you know, yeah. over the over the years I've been doing this podcast, you know, I've, I've inter- interviewed some extremely interesting people who have very interesting stories and do very diverse things. And it's amazing how many people you meet who have done those things who are, you know, came over as Nova teachers or as like, the, like you said, the Eikaiwa teachers. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the, there's... Nowadays, I meet lots of ex-jet teachers, and I think that's because the people who tend to do jet seem to learn Japanese very well because they're based in the countryside. Very well. true, yeah, yeah. So I think they, the jet guys really do get a, a great start in Japan. Whereas when I was at Nova, I don't think any of us spoke a word of Japanese. Yeah, Japanese true. Uh, for the, mm. Because you know, just ordering in Shirokiya and places like that. <laughs> True, true enough, right? I suppose people who are in jet, who are in the rural areas, and and take that the effort and have that opportunity to really learn Japanese. Once they're done with jet and they decide they yeah. want to stay in Japan because they've got the language skills, they've got a lot more opportunities, right? Yeah, it, but it's good as well, isn't it? It's nice to see that you can come over to do something and then not for you, or can if you, if you keep an open mind about it. Yeah, yeah, true, true. Very true. Okay, so um, tell us um, a little bit about your interest in, in Japan. How did how did that happen? Like, how did you end up coming to Japan in the first place? Were were you interested in Japan since you were a child? Uh, not at all. To be honest, it was I almost feel a bit of a charlatan because like, lots of the people who come over and stay for a long time, like or was very good and I had lots of student loans to pay off. Okay. But I'd come and teach English for a year and that might pay off enough student loans for me to go back to university to, to be postgraduate. Mm-hmm. But then I, I met a student, an adult, mm-hmm. <laughs> who, who is now my wife. Okay, yeah. And uh, things changed like very quickly, yeah. Nice. Nice. And so... Mm-hmm. It's almost impressive because so many people do have that that real passion that they come to Japan with, which which is a very positive thing. I quite like talking to people when they come over with, you know, a real goal. But I came over quite aimlessly and just <laughs> and ended up staying here. Nice. And 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 here you are. Okay. And now yeah. now 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 you are living in Tokyo. And um, yeah. you, are, you are no longer a teacher. You are a travel writer. So can yeah. you tell us a little bit about where that began? How did, how did your writing career blossom, so to speak? And can you tell us a little bit about the kind of, the kind of writing work you do? Okay. It's quite a convoluted story. So uh, I suppose if I start with what I do now, mm-hmm. I write books about Japan, quite often guidebooks, sometimes like the... Um, the Onsen Ryokan book. It's mm-hmm. not really a guide, it's more of a, a book about the culture. Mm-hmm. I write features for people like National Geographic, Traveller, in flight magazines, and different companies like that. Okay. But that's now, but I got into it about 10 years ago. Because, you know, I, I realized that I was about to get married, mm-hmm. and I was still an English teacher, and I, I I know lots of people like teaching, but it wasn't for me. Yeah. So I had to kind of, I had to find a, a thing I could do that I wanted to do to stay here. Yeah. So I did postgraduate diploma of journalism. Oh, really? Okay. To, just to, yeah, whilst I was teaching, because I was teaching mostly a Cairo at the time, a slack schedule, which is one of the great benefits of it. I didn't like the teaching, mm-hmm. but 
the schedule was fantastic. So I could actually do a postgraduate diploma quite comfortably whilst was teaching. Nice, nice. That, that meant I was studying about journalism and then I started selling my coursework basically to overseas <laughs> magazines. Hmm. And then that made me realize that if they're taking work from a student, they must be a niche or there must be something mm -hmm. so that gave me the idea that i could focus on rather than trying to get a job within a media company i could do freelancing and sell work for overseas okay and it all came from there so you've essentially been freelancing you know for the better part of your or most of your writing career yeah i i did a year as the the deputy editor of a magazine called the Hero Gamers, which I imagine some people listening to this will know because it's, it's a bilingual thing that's it's quite good for studying Japanese or English. Actually, you, you cut it for a moment. Can you say one more time the name of the magazine? Yeah, okay. Sorry, it's the Hiragana Times. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, yeah. I've seen, I can remember um, yeah. leafing through that like even like years ago when I when I originally came to Japan, say maybe like 2008, and going to like different bookstores yeah. with the English section and, and looking through that magazine. That's that's about the time I was would have been there for my year as deputy editor. Okay, <laughs> quite a long time ago, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, and it's it's quite a quirky magazine because I mean I love the people there to bits, but it's ugly as hell to look at. It's got a really old fashioned design. <laughs> it's quite gaudy, but mm -hmm. it's actually very functional. It really is quite a good thing for for studying Japanese or studying English because the way they pair the text next to each other. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, my only experience in real media oh, okay. if you want to call it real media and so the rest has been freelancing wow cool and now um you know the, the reason why i've um you know i asked you to come on the podcast is because yeah. i've always been interested in you know onsen culture the Okan culture um i think i the first time i ever went to something like an onsen it would have been a like an equivalent of a sento i suppose in um when I used to live in Korea, those are very popular in Korea. Uh, they're called Jim Jelbong. Jim Jelbong, oh, really? I think. Um, but those are more like Sentos. And I used to go to them all the time when I lived mm. there. Um, and, you know, when I came to Japan, I remember like one of the first vacations my wife and I had together um, was to go to Kinosaki Onsen Town in Hyogo Prefecture. Okay. Because I lived in Kobe my entire 10 years, almost 10 years in, in Japan. Um, but um, you, you recently published a book about onsens and ryokan culture and whatnot. You know, you, you mentioned that the ryokan is kind of a, a way of, you know, pampering yourself in Japan, a very kind of relaxing way of, of, of having a vacation or maybe taking some time off. Now, what exactly is, so, I mean, the, the ryokan is more like a traditional Japanese inn. Wouldn't maybe that be a, a good way of describing it? Yeah, now, now an onsen, what the heck is that? For for the people for the people out there who might not know, or... onsen mm -hmm. is basically, basically okay. The onsen is basically the natural hot spring water or the hot spring bath. Okay. And for example, if you go to a ryokan in Kyoto, you don't always get an onsen with it in a city center kind of inn. Mm -hmm. But where you went in was it Kinosaki? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But then you're more out in the countryside, and you've got Basically, they, they usually go together. The Yokan has a natural hot spring bath or bath, and that's the onsen. Okay. So the, the onsen is up now, but there's... So often, like, the onsen is part of the Yokan, right? Yeah, usually. And you, so very often, you'll get a couple of big communal onsen baths, one for women, one for men. Mm -hmm. And you might get some private and rent for yourself or you might have if it's an expensive place you might have one in your hotel room mm. nice i haven't had one of those <laughs> more the communal experience <laughs> yeah like, well the communal thing's nice though isn't it I, I, yeah it is fine I, mean, I know one of your questions you sent through was about people being nervous about getting naked mm. that's something that it doesn't bother me at all. Yeah, I'll whip, <laughs> whip my clothes off anyway. <laughs> the middle of Shibu the middle of Shibuya. 
Well, almost, almost anywhere. <laughs> and not on a cold night. But, <laughs> but you know, if, if you're in somewhere, let's say, that's got a communal onsen and you're feeling quite nervous about taking your clothes off, you can still rent the private one. Mm. True, true. So, I, I, you know, I, I, it, there's a nice balance there. You, you, can, you can go and rent a little place just to go to the communal place. You could, you could spend extra and have one in your room. You've got all sorts of options. Mm. It, it's not just about getting naked with strangers. So, <laughs> you know, nice balance. Nice. Now, you know, the neocon and the onsen, would you say that these are kind of an important historical or an important part of Japanese culture? But again, when you say important, I mean, if they weren't there, would anyone mind? I don't know. I suppose life would continue, right? You'd get right? past it, couldn't you? Yeah, yeah, true, true. Yeah. But I think they're, they're a really nice way, especially if I think about me living in Tokyo, and my wife is Japanese, and my son is a bit of both. Mm -hmm. For us, going to, you know, we live in a place, a small apartment. It's very modern. There's no tatami flooring. There's no Japanese design whatsoever. Okay. Um, our life is very modern in a Japanese sense. And the only chance that, say, my wife would have to do something traditional is to go to an onsen, perhaps, or a ryokan. And that's the place where you can enjoy the, the tatami flooring, the traditional meal, the nice bath. You can change into the traditional clothing, like the yukata gown. So I think it, it's a nice way for people to connect with Japanese tradition still, when mm -hmm. they're living a very modern life, if that makes any sense. No, it does, absolutely. Maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe playing it a little bit, but I think there's that element to it. Well, I guess that... And I also think that... Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no, continue, continue. Okay, sorry. In, in terms of craftsmanship of creating the rooms and like the wooden decorations you might find in a room or mm -hmm. all these other little design elements, the fact that the ryokan is still there means that the craftsmen still have a job to do. Sure. So true. there are all these little tie-ins, you know. Well, I think they are, they are important. They're important to me anyway. Mm. And I'm... One of the foreigners in Japan who generally traditional Japanese things don't do much for me. Okay. So it's kind of odd in a way that I I really like this particular traditional element. Nice. I would ne I would have never thought of myself as, as kind of really getting into a traditional Japanese thing, but I guess this one does something for me that I, I'd never thought about. So I suppose that that falls really nicely into the question. One of the questions I, I wanted to ask you was, why should people visiting Japan experience onsens and ryokan? And I guess in a way, you know, they're, that, that's that's an opportunity for them to ex another opportunity for them to experience the traditional side of Japan. Yeah, I think so. But also, I mean, it's it's not the case with every place because there are some inns that are very focused on on overseas tourists. Okay. So they will change their offering slightly. You know, they'll they'll water things down. But in most parts, it's a it's a chance to do something Japanese that genuinely is Japanese. It's it's not like going to watch a ninja show or something like that, which is, <laughs> you know, it's it's still fun, but it's very touristy. Yeah, you're doing something the Japanese actually do, and you're doing it in a way that the Japanese do it, which. I hate the term authentic, but, you know, because it gets overplayed a bit. But it is, isn't it? I can't think of a better word for it. It's an authentic Japanese experience. Well, I mean, what, you and know. it's one that is. Mm -hmm. so I, yeah, I was just thinking that years ago, like I mentioned how I visited uh, Kinosaki Onsen with my wife. Yeah. And the, one of the things that I really remember about that place is that, um, you know, we were staying in one onsen. But you could wand, you you could put on the the kind of like yukata, and 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 have your your sandals, and you could wander around. I think there were seven or eight different like public onsens just around the the, the downtown area that you could just 
visit and you just see all these people, just couples wandering around wearing the yukatas outside, going from one onsen to another onsen to another onsen. And it was, it was a really, I even, I, you know, I have to admit I did that early on in my Japan days. But now that I, lo I look back at it, that was a pretty cool experience. Yeah, it is, isn't it? And I, I think I did something, I can't remember where it was, maybe Minakami or somewhere like that was my first onsen trip when I was still you know, dating my wife. Yeah. And it's it, it's really quite striking. Oh, Kawaguchiko, that's it, sorry. Kawaguchiko. And mm. it's really kind of, it's odd when, when you come from Tokyo and suddenly you're not that far away from Tokyo, but there are people walking around in the streets in Yukata and... <laughs> yeah. It's a really different kind of feeling, but it, it's it's quite a natural thing that's happening. It's not it's not like going to a theme park. Um, people dress up. It's a natural expression, I think, of culture. Yeah. No. No. And even so, <laughs> I said all that. I, I still never I never put the yukata on at all because I, I feel really kind of uncomfortable in the yukata. I, okay. I can't explain why, but <laughs> okay. Um... Maybe because I'm, I'm six. Six foot tall and they never fit properly. I don't know, but well, I'm I, I'm five foot seven, so I never have that issue. Yeah. They fit just right. Um, <laughs> now, you know, we already kind of um, touched on it before a little bit. You know, one of the questions I had for you was, um, you know, advice for people who might be a bit shy about public nudity. Um, but that kind of also leads me into asking. And there's just something I just thought of off the top of my head. Um, you know, obviously, a lot of people who are American, they are British, they are Australian, Canadian. Um, in 2018, a lot of us, well, I'm not, but a lot of people are sporting tattoos. Um, and a few onsens I've been to clearly have signs that say, no tattoos allowed. Can you tell us a little bit about, because I've had over the years a lot of people contact me, asking me questions about that. They're like, you know, hey, Kevin, I want to go to Japan. I, w I would love to go to onsens, but I have tattoos. Um, what, what advice would you have? First of all, I, I guess you already touched on it for the people who might be scared of the nudity thing, but also people who, who do have tattoos. Yeah, I mean, that's something that came up this week on Twitter. It, it was, I think it was the, the at being Tokyo account, wasn't it? Where oh, really? I didn't see that. Someone, someone was just, yeah, it, it's quite interesting because you, I know it's got the Yakuza Mafia connection, hasn't it? Yes, in Japan. Yeah, yeah, traditionally. Yeah, but basically, they... The mafia were the guys with tattoos, I think. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, by banning tattoos, they were basically banning mafia from coming into places. I guess they, were, they weren't. They were the, sign, the, sign, the sign didn't say no mafia, no yakuza, basically. But their way of saying no tattoos because everyone who was a mobster yeah. had tattoos. It was their way of keeping those people. Out. Mm. It's ridiculously outdated. Yeah, I mean, I don't have any tattoos, but. <laughs> But it's madness to think that just because you have a tattoo, you can't go and take a bath. Yes. Um, and I think m mainly nowadays, this applies to center public bathhouses. Okay. Because where you're paying, I'd actually, I haven't been to one, so I don't know how much you pay. 300 yen, 500 yen, I don't know. Something like that, yeah. Maybe, maybe about 500 yen, maybe, yeah. yeah. And I can imagine if you're in there paying that much money and someone says, Someone else using the bath points out he's got a tattoo. You could get thrown out. As ridiculous as that is, it could happen. So yeah, I mean, they can. They mm -hmm. are a different beast because you're you're paying a lot of money to go. To go to can even if you've got it's a different kind of customer because you're staying there for the night. And I've never heard of a, a yogan telling people who were paying to stay that they can't also bath. Well, well, there was actually, I stayed in one, so I, I, I stayed in one last December in um, Shikoku, mm -hmm. in, right on the opposite end of Awaji Island, so near Naruto, and it actually, that was a ryokan we were oh. saying, we were saying, it, saying at this onsen, a ryokan for a few days, and they actually had a sign that said, right in front of the public bath, a sign in, in English, it said no tattoos. That's insane, isn't it? And um, honestly, my advice, my advice for that would be just go and get in the bath. And if, if seriously, if someone picks you up on it and you're paying to stay, just give them hell. Mm. That's the only way. The only way that you'll actually get kind of slightly backward 
thinking hotel owners or yokan owners to change is if you kick up a fuss because no one in Japan likes like someone shouting at them in the the <laughs> lobby, do they? Especially <laughs> sure, sure. if they're naked and tap just come out wet from a bath. <laughs> they're, so, na- um, they're, they're naked, they're wet, and they're Canadian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And if they're like me, they look like a Yeti. So <laughs> they, they wouldn't want that. On, honestly, there, there's no legal grounding. You don't sign a contract that when you go into a, a Vyokan that says, mm-hmm. I've got a tattoo, so I hereby forego my right to have a, a bath. And so I think you don't really need to worry about it with um, with a ryokan. Nice. Unless you're visiting a ryokan as a, I'm not sure how you, how you say it. You're, like, you're not staying there, but you're going to use their bath as an outside guest. Oh, okay, okay. As a sento, then it might be different. But if you're staying there, I wouldn't worry about it. If you're paying the like the five dollar no. the five hundred yen versus paying several hundred yeah. dollars a night. If you're paying several hundred dollars, don't worry about it. Most people won't <laughs> kick up a fuss if there is a law in place. Or not a law, if they if they have a, a oh, manner guideline in place. Yeah. And if they do, just get hell. <laughs> it's really not worth worrying about. Nice, nice. Good advice. You heard well, that, 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 you heard that <laughs> folks. That's the, from, from the expert the, himself. The, the God. <laughs> yeah, give him hell. Give him hell, yeah, give him hell. Nice. Okay, well, you know, you've yeah. recently um, published a book um, about yeah. the Okana Nonsense. So I'm curious, can you tell us a little about the book, um, what the title is, and, you know, about the process of writing it? How did you, yeah, how did it all come together? Okay, the book, oh, which I don't have in front of me, so I might get the title wrong. <laughs> it's Japanese Inns and Hot Springs. <laughs> and then it's got a very long subtitle I can't remember, but it's Japanese Inns and Hot Springs. Okay. And Jack. basically, it, it covers... It's, I'm the writer. The photographer is a, an 82-year-old Japanese guy called Akihiko Seki. And what we did is we did... Focus on forty best of your can in the country. Um, obviously, there's no such thing as the forty best. There could be a hundred great ones, hundred and fifty great ones, but we've taken forty. Okay. Um, naturally, there's quite a big focus on Kyoto areas like that. Hmm. And there's nothing in Okinawa because Okinawa really doesn't have much. Onsen action going on, or not? Not onsen in the open. And so we've, we've got 40 books, and basically it's, it looks at what makes each one of these 40 places different, what you can do in the area whilst you're there, and then there are sections up front about etiquette. Okay. Which doesn't include anything on tattoos, which maybe I should do on the um, second edition. But and also how 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 a stay kind of what's the process of a stay? You know, you walk in, you met in the lobby, you take your shoes off, have the welcome drink, and it kind of takes you through standard stay life. Okay. And the idea is that hopefully it will kind of I think some people are kind of put off because they think it's such a Japanese thing, it might be difficult to to really get into. But hopefully it kind of it, if you read it before you go, you get a good sense of, okay, now I know what's going to happen, and I can relax a little and just let it happen. Okay, nice, nice. Now, oh, by the way, I'm... The places, mm-hmm. well, no, I was just actually looking at... Uh, uh, can... Sorry, we've got a good... Now, oh, got, got, a lag. Yeah, we got a lag there, so uh, Just Japan Podcast listeners, if you're wondering why it sounds a bit kind of confusing as we have our back and forth, Rob and I. We, we've got some uh, internet connectivity issues, so there's a bit of a lag back and forth. But um, I was just going to say, Rob, I went to your Twitter feed. I'm looking right now at the books, and uh, it's Japanese Inns and Hot Springs, A Guide to Japan's Best Studio Con and Onsen. That would be, that's a full title. <laughs> cool. That's right, because when we, when, when we produced it, we, obviously we've got Japanese inns, hot springs, and then we've got the Japanese, the Ryokan and Onsen. 
we weren't sure which way round to do it. We have the Japanese that reveal Kam and Onsen, and then the subtitle is English, or vice versa. But it took us a long time to kind of work out which way round to do it. I'm curious when you when you were putting the book together and doing your research, how many onsens did you personally? How many onsens and Diokon did you personally visit? Okay, well we've got forty in the book, mm -hmm. and Seki-san went to all forty because he he had to take the photos of them. Okay, and I and we stayed at about twenty of them together. Oh wow. <laughs> Which is really, really tough research, you know. <laughs> really, I, I, my wife was, you know, every every night I was sending her photos and bath photos, food photos. And I, I'm going to assume you had a publisher, um, you know, taking care of this for you. Yeah, we 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 have the the contract beforehand. So. Oh, nice, nice. Okay, there you go. So this isn't just you, like, you know, going into your savings and like, okay, we're going to try to make this work here. No, so. Well, basically, what, what happens, I mean, a publisher wouldn't pay for you to do the trips. What, what happens is you, we, we, choose the, we chose the places now that we wanted to go to, mm -hmm. and then we set up interviews with each of them. Okay. So, obviously, the photographer had to go and arrange to shoot every place. And then, in some cases, I'd go along and just interview the owner and just have a look at the place to get a sense of what it's like. Okay. And then in some places, off season, they they let you stay for a night so you can experience it. Oh, okay. But nice. the point is, they were all they were all chosen beforehand. Okay. So it wasn't a case of you know, give us a freebie and you can you can be in the, <laughs> the book. Gotcha, gotcha. It's a, we're putting you in the book. Can we come and talk to you? So nice. Okay. Wow. So, so speaking, I suppose that's a distinction. So the photographer, you said, eighty years old. Yeah, he, and he's he's unbelievable. He, he outdrank me at almost every place we stayed as well, which is in, quite impressive. <laughs> nice, and and yeah, he he traveled to forty different onsens. Wow. Yeah, he he lived in in London in the sixties and America in the seventies as a business guy, and then he retired I think when he was fifty five. Okay. And then just decided that's it. I'm going to be a photographer until I, you know, until it's time to clock out. And so he's 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 not clocked out yet, and he, I don't think he will for a long time. But he's so he spent the last twenty twenty five years traveling around, taking photos of spas in Asia and hotels in Asia. And that's amazing. All around Japan, amazing. And he's got a ton of energy. Wow! Incredible! Incredible! So, um, Every time I was flagging on the trips, you know, like the third, especially the third night on a, a road trip is always the one that gets me. Just as like, I'd like to go to bed early, you know. The 82-year-old guy is there. Come on, let's go for a drink. Come on. Oh, my gosh. That's amazing. And here I am. I mean, yeah. He's on twice your age. Is, yeah. Is, is, is like he's twice my age. And I'm, I'm like, at 9 o'clock, I'm yawning and wanting to nod off. Um, you know, and that's, that involves no travel or drinking. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm the same. Exactly the same. So, okay, so now, um, you know, the last time we talked, and for all of you guys out there listening, this is yeah. a second attempt at this interview. Um, we tried this several months ago um, in the fall, and because of just tech, tech issues, internet connectivity issues, it didn't work out. Um, and at that point, you had a book that was going to be coming out. Now you the book is published and it's available for people to buy. Yep. So yeah. tell us um tell us where people actually just shamelessly plug yourself and, and plug the book. <laughs> okay, well actually being traditionally British, that's the difficult thing to do, isn't it? But uh, oh, okay, I've lived well, overseas long enough that I, <laughs> I, I can ignore that. Okay. It's okay. it's on Amazon. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Basically if um it should be available on most Amazons now. It's not on Amazon China yet. I, I checked the other day. Okay. But it's on Amazon Japan. It's on uh, USA, Amazon UK. All the big ones. I think it's Amazon, all, all of the Amazons, basically. Mm -hmm. 
Although for some reason the UK one it always comes out about a month later. I have no idea why. With any book, <laughs> Amazon yeah. UK is always a, a little bit slow. <laughs> and if you're in Japan, I guess the usual suspects like Kinokuniya, Madazen, they should have. It should have it, I hope. Okay. Um, and also the airports. If you're coming in Nabi to Haneda, the bookshops there should have it. Okay, nice. Bookshops overseas, I'm not really sure, to be honest. Um, I know that my mum found an old Kyoto guidebook of mine the other day in a bookshop in England. She was quite excited. Nice. But very often, but very often they don't seem to make it into bookshops in the UK. So that was... That was a bit of a rarity. So it's again. So you guys out there listening, it's called Japanese Inns and Hot Springs: uh, A Guide to Japan's Best Ryokan and Onsen. Um, and now also, you put you you got a, a featured picture on your Twitter feed, which, by the way, guys, is at Rob Goss Writer. Um, if you're Twitter people, um, I see another guidebook here you've got here called uh, Japan Traveler's Companion: Japan's Most Famous Sites. From Okinawa to Hokkaido. So there's another one you've written, oh, huh? That, that came out... They were meant to come out six months apart, but to do with, you know, different production schedules, always shift around and whatnot. That came out at the same time. Which mm. I'm not sure if it's a good thing or not. It's always nicer to be able to push one book hard rather than try to do two at once. Okay. But basically, it's available in all things. It's... I think it's... It's kind of billed as an alternative guidebook, but there's not much guide information. It's more of a primer on the places you can go in Japan. Okay. And because it's got lots of photos, it, it functions as a nice souvenir or the kind of thing you could give as a gift. Nice. So, I mean, it's nice. It, I like it, <laughs> but I, I probably won't read it for at least a year because I never can once a book comes out. No. Nice. Oh, okay, okay. okay. Um, so so you... Then, mm. it, It'll be okay. I was going to say, and, and again, we're fighting the internet lag here. Um, for you Just Japan podcast listeners, um, all of the links that we've talked about to um, the Japanese Inns and Hot Springs book and the other books by Rob, they're all going to be in the show notes at JustJapanStuff.com. So go to JustJapanStuff.com. Everything will be there. Um, most, it's going to be all over the, the Facebook page and the Twitter, all that stuff. I'll be tweeting it out, sharing it on Facebook, all that stuff. So don't worry. It's out there if you missed it. Uh, yeah. Um, so I, I'm curious, um, do you have any, um, uh, if, if you can say, um, are you working on anything interesting at the moment with regards to writing about Japan? Uh, interesting? I'm not sure. I guess we'll find out if you buy it or not in the end. But um, with, with the same photographer, we're doing a book on Tokyo at the moment. Oh, okay. But rather, rather than looking at you know, Shibuya, Amate Sando, and all that kind of stuff. We're focusing on the west of the city and the islands down south. Okay. Plus the traditional things you can do in, in central Tokyo. And that's going to be coming out with a different publisher this time. It's going to be with IBC Publishing. And I think it's going to be out in August, which means I have to finish it quite, quite quickly and I've not done much of it yet. Uh-oh. So um, you got to get to work. So the next, couple, the next couple of months, I'll be writing lots of that, and that'll be out in August. Okay, nice. But I, I, that, no, that'll be nice because on lots of like I've done Tokyo guidebooks before, and I've updated like rough guides and photos and all those kind of things, mm-hmm. and they're all really nice. But they kind of ignore the islands a little bit. They ignore the west a little bit. And they tend to focus on the modern part of the city rather than the, the traditional things you can do in the city. Of course, yeah. And considering that Sekisan is 82 years old, he knows all sorts about the traditional mm. So it, it's been quite good. I mean, I've, he's taken me to loads of places I never knew existed. All around, like Nihonbashi kind of area, Kayabacho, all these small little restaurants that have been there for 50 years and he used to go to when he worked in the neighborhood as a young man and all you know it's really interesting cool wow so you've got a really i mean you've got hopefully it'll 
you've, you've got a partner in crime essentially who's who's a really amazing source of of history and culture in his own right yeah yeah i mean and it's it's entertaining when you take him to someone like amata sander he's completely a fish out of water and it's <laughs> it's hilarious it's it's his running commentary like what's what's she wearing is that a is that a man or a woman and that kind of thing the old guy kind of commentary yeah yeah, yeah, quite yeah. funny nice but when you the traditional traditional areas it's really mm. if i can learn it from him as we're writing the book and hopefully that can be passed on to people that read it yeah exactly nice because nice. i think it is harder it's harder to access traditional tokyo if you're coming from overseas and especially coming from overseas if you don't speak japanese we're sorry the number you have dialed is not in service at this time okay here we are 12 hours later because we had a few technical issues at the end of the recording last night so very quick thank you to kevin for having me on and thank you to everyone who listened if anyone wants to say hi afterwards i'm on twitter at at rob goss writer i'm also on instagram with the the tag at tokyo freelance so hopefully i'll see some of you guys there thank you very much Well, I want to thank Rob for taking the time to sit down with the Just Japan podcast and share his knowledge about a really wonderful aspect of Japanese culture, travel culture. And if you ever have the opportunity to come to Japan and travel, you definitely need to to give it a try. Uh, I've stayed in a few ryokan. I've definitely enjoyed onsen in my time in Japan, and I highly recommend. So again, Rob, thank you for coming on the podcast. Of course, you go to the show notes at justjapanstuff.com, and you can find all of the links to uh, his contact information, all the stuff he's doing, links to the, his books and stuff. If you want to, I, hey guys, pick up a copy of his book. I suggest that um, you know and uh, learn more firsthand or secondhand. Buy the book, come to Japan, and learn firsthand and secondhand through the book. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Well, that does it for another episode of the podcast. Thank you so much for listening, guys. Thank you for taking the time to download the podcast. And remember, you can help the podcast grow by sharing it on your social media with your friends, your family. Um, spread the word about the Just Japan podcast. And of course, over at YouTube, my YouTube channel, Busan Kevin, um, I'm putting the podcast over there as well. So if you just want to pop it on in YouTube and kick around the house while you're doing things, you can do it that way as well. Uh, yeah, so that's it, guys. Remember, you can find everything we talked about today over at JustJapanStuff.com. Uh, like the Facebook page, follow me on Twitter, all that jazz. And of course, you can also support the show over er, on Patreon, patreon.com slash, slash, I'm having trouble talking right now, Just Japan Podcast. So patreon.com slash Just Japan Podcast, and you can help us grow that way as well. All right, guys, that's it for this week. Uh, thank you for listening. My name's Kevin. Uh, I am a guy who uh, has strong connections with Japan after 10 years of living there, and yeah, I'll be there again. Don't worry about it, guys. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm coming to you from Beijing, China, talking about Japan. And uh, wherever you are in the world, folks, I hope you're happy. Hope you're healthy. I'll be talking to you real soon.